you think it's funny that you... That was seven months ago. Maybe you need longer without a bedroom. He didn't eat anything. He was sleeping on the floor in the family room. My parent am not responsible for how my child feels. Dude, oh my god. Ah! The thing was so nasty. That video, the intro was so nasty that it's like, it, it has like a secondary effect on me. Like, I'm still thinking about it and it's still like, it's like, like giving me shock waves throughout my fucking has. body right now. It, oh my god. Ah! Like, I feel it right here. It's like a, like a, ASMR video, you know what I mean? Like, you know how ASMR video like tickles the part of your brain? I feel like that's what I don't know if I'll ever be the same again, dude. You know, I've watched all manner of shit on this broadcast, too. This was like, this was one shit too far. I mean, literally a human eating the shit. I don't know if it was like the way it was edited. I don't know if it was just like the sequence that they just like put it together in. I, I just, I could not do it and I apologize, okay? At Hussein Abbey loved over the past year since I first watching you through the ups and downs you've that always was been crazy man hope, that was actually fucking wild you dude take some time off for yourself if you're wanting it cheers do you know what time it is YouTube is the number one most visited website on the internet, making it one of the easiest and most accessible avenues for Secular anyone talk. looking to monetize their art. For some, that art comes in the form of animations, while for others, it could be something along the lines of movie or music reviews, with some genres being more demanding than others. Vlogging, for example, involves sacrificing your privacy in exchange for a certain level of authenticity. Documenting both the highs and the lows of your day-to-day -day life can lend itself to a more to genuine experience from the ads. viewer's perspective, regardless of how exaggerated certain events may be. To me, the fake cops! Those are fake cops, right? Now I know, right? Now we know those are fake cops, right? We know that now. Same fake cops. The ad break is not fake, though. It's coming right now, and it's very real. It's top of the hour every hour. It's time for a 60-second ad break. Typical vlog is just content for people to live through. But Tomato it's this cleaning personal duty. connection mixed with a stream of highly edited and entertaining videos that makes for a winning combination on YouTube. With many of these channels racking up an unprecedented amount of dedicated viewers regularly. But what happens when you bring children into the mix? And at what point does this steady stream of family friendly content suddenly drift into exploitation? How much can true go wrong when every minute detail of your life is presented to an audience of millions? I'd say this is a pretty important question, at least in the case of a woman named Ruby Frank. Whenever we start sharing the, the details of how we actually parent, we get, we get a lot of upset. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ruby and Kevin Frank are the owners of a popular family vlog channel known as 8 Passengers, where they upload around 3 videos a week documenting their lives for a dedicated fan base of over 2 million people, uh -oh. garnering well over 1 billion total views since their launch in 2015. With her husband preoccupied as an assistant professor at BYU, Ruby ultimately runs the show, along with her four sisters who also maintain channels of their own. Oh my god, he said BYU, boys. That's it. That's it, dude. Mormons. Automatic content machine, dude. Brigham Young University where pornography is banned. Kind of like the entire country of Turkey. Brigham Young University. Oh, all not falling under young. the same common theme of family vlogging. If you cut one more thing in my house, we're chopping his head off. 
<laughs> I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, what? and I'm going to cut its head off. Grandma, you be so mad! I want to tell you something, and I want you to really listen. We should and have been in, in that crash. Put them in your pocket so you can take them down to the hamper to and drop and give me ten. Like One. Put your hands straight out. They're in. They're not supposed to be out. Shape your hands forward. What the fuck? There you go. No! One. Two, down further, bring your butt down. Through her years of lifestyle mommy vlog entertainment, Ruby has accumulated a net of almost 500,000 Instagram followers and a rough estimate of $2.5 million. Though it's hard to imagine Ruby's enormous success without the help of her six children, all of which I will be censoring for the sake of respecting their own privacy. With two boys and four girls, the ages of these children range from 17 all the way down to six years old. In fact, the very first video on the Eight Passengers channel was the gender reveal of that very six-year-old. Meaning this fast-paced YouTube vlogger lifestyle is all this six-year-old girl knows. Her life has been subjected to the cruel lens of a video camera since she was literally in the womb. But hey, I'm sure that'll have no greater impact on her development whatsoever. I mean, how would you feel if the most critical years of your growth had been exploited for the sole purpose of granting your parents monetary success and online prevalence. In terms of the Eight Passengers channel, the controversy surrounding this lovely couple runs a little deeper than what you may see on the surface. At first glance, they may seem like your typical run-of-the-mill family, simply trying to share their joyous journey with the rest of the world, plus a few overly clickbaity thumbnails. But from what I and many others have observed as of late, there seems to be something far more sinister happening here. Um, I actually was thinking about you, Julie. Mm. Can I have a conversation with you? Mm. Not the talk, not right here. Actually, that's what it is. No, it's not. No, right. no, no. Uh, no. I'm not doing this, not doing this. Okay, so here, just come sit by me. I mean, you can agree or disagree with the way a parent goes about discussing puberty with their kids. I mean, I just learned everything through the internet, which definitely didn't stunt my development at all. But I think most people would agree that filming such an awkward moment and uploading it to a family-friendly channel seemingly against your own child's will is a little unnecessary. Um, can you not film it? Um... So I just watched. <laughs> you just got rejected. Of course, there's no way they cannot not film it. If they did not film it, how are they supposed to make money and pay for your schooling, kid? Kids nowadays have it way too easy. Back in her day, they actually had this outdated thing called privacy. I mean, right in the same video, these kids are pleading with Ruby not to have this talk on camera. Forget the conversation itself. The fact that it's having to be broadcast to countless strangers on the internet is embarrassing enough in itself. Self. Imagine having to show your face at school knowing there are kids in your class who have seen you have such a personal talk with your parents. Any kid that age would be humiliated. What about the time Ruby uploaded her 11 year old daughter's first shave? Or her other daughter's first shave? Or her son's first shave? Julie has been asking all summer if she can shave her legs and armpits. I think every girl has a story where they're in a rush it will cut. So there's a lot of hair in there, actually. <laughs> it's Mom, don't show that. It's just very bizarre to me. Quite frankly, it's these types of videos that attract not only children, but pedophiles. Creepy old men have a history of putting timestamps in the comments where kids are in compromising positions. And to me, such blatant clickbait doesn't exactly dissuade that kind of attention. I remember feeling weird enough already during puberty, but the thought of my parents whipping out a video camera and detailing every single event that happened during that uncomfortable phase makes me want to gag. Maybe a medium would be right. Do you want to take those and, and try? What about me? What? <laughs> no, not, not, you don't have to try them on here. You can find a dressing room. Mom. She's all embarrassed. So, did it work? <laughs> How come you're all embarrassed?
Because you're filming her and you're her dad? <laughs> <There's> not... <laughs> I'll admit, some of their videos are a little more tame than others, but when it comes to titles that involve puberty or periods, it just comes off to me as a projection of your child's own insecurities to a much wider range of people for the aim of making money. And I think it's pretty hard to go about doing that in a tasteful manner. I've had to get after her a few times to wash her face and to remind her to take a bath or a shower. I'm gonna give her this. It's a little gold ring. It's kind of like the one Julie got for her birthday. And I'm just gonna tell her that when she wears it to remember that her body is a blessing and it's a good thing and everything that's happening to her is good and remember to take care of it. I just keep going back to the thought of having their friends at school being able These to access all of this. And when lives. I say friends, I mean it pretty loosely since it would seem they don't have any according to them. And now I have no friends. You can play with friends. No, like I don't have friends. I don't have friends either. I literally like told my friends I'm not hanging out with them. I don't even know where they live. These kids have been pretty open with their mom about their lack of friends at school, which would honestly be crushing to any mother with a heart. But in the case of Ruby, it would seem that despite her apparently strict militaristic household, it's not hard to see where her priorities lie. Chad hasn't had a flip phone, a smartphone, any kind of phone, and it's been over a year. Mm -hmm. And um, I still have no intention of returning a phone. Abby, we took the phone away from Abby um, in November, I and and you may you may never get the phone back. Probably not. Um, if I was to go back and redo anything in parenting, it would be not to give the kids a phone. Yeah, so there will be basically no technology over the summer. Wait, I get it. You shoehorn enough of your miserable life into the spotlight that it's only natural for the more negative sides to show themselves. But openly denying your child the most basic necessity is a little bit more than 30 seconds out of a 20 minute video. As described by the eldest passenger on Instagram. I just got a text message uh, from Eve's teacher and she said that Eve did not pack a lunch today and can I bring a lunch over to the school bonded and just said Eve is responsible for making her lunches in the morning and she actually told me she did pack a lunch. Like, I'm sorry, but what did you really expect from a five-year-old girl? My mom is a kindergarten teacher and I know for a fact those snot-nosed cretins cannot be expected to tie their own shoes, What's let alone really remember to prepare an entire meal for themselves. Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch because then she's not gonna learn from the natural outcome. Oh, what, you just trust that if your kid feels hungry enough by the end of the day, she'll learn how to pack her own food more diligently next time? You've got a little treat there, some Nutella sticks. Why does she take the sandwich out and then put it in a container? Oh. Yeah, maybe because she's five. She doesn't know what to pick out because she's a child. If I had to pack my own lunch at that age, I'd be eating nothing but goldfish and gushers five days out of the week. My hope is that she'll be hungry and come home and go, oh man, that was really painful being hungry all day. I will make sure to always have a lunch with me. I know I'm not exactly experienced in this field, but I could never see myself doing that kind of thing as a parent. The definition of neglect in most states is the failure of a parent or caregiver to provide needed food, shelter, clothing, medical care, or supervision to the degree that a child's health, safety, and well-being are threatened with harm. The first part of that definition should ring a couple bells. My job as a parent is to provide for the needs of my kids, the needs that they cannot meet themselves. You know, providing food, providing a safe place. Um, kids have a really hard time providing their own safe space. That is my responsibility. He, they're gonna think you're torturing him. Stop it. I know you're not, but it looks like you are. Okay, Russell. <laughs> I'm only gonna say it one more time. Listen, you guys wanted me to watch JCS videos about murderers. So I decided, fuck that. We should instead watch how to make serial killers. Because this is how. If you're wondering how you 
create an entire generation of serial killers do this this one this one trick okay i i am i'd be shocked if they come out normal after any of this dude this is the pre-jcs you never get the prequel origin story of jcs I feel like almost all of these like fucking family uh, uh, oriented YouTube channels like do some form of this. This is like the worst case of it, obviously. I mean, this is basically the worst version of that. Almost two and a half years hassle. But I do feel as though, uh, you know, a lot of these channels pr do, they operate under the same mentality, under the same basis. Of just like, you know, monetizing child abuse. But hey, maybe they should have just put like, uh, abusing my children, prank, emotional. So there you go. That's how they, that's, it is safe now. Time, and then you're gonna lose the privilege to eat dinner. <laughs> Never mind the fact that her youngest daughter somehow slipped away and fell down a gutter or something. I, I don't know. I could barely find any information about this. <clears throat> One of the reasons I... Oh, no. What are you doing? You are so crazy, girl. Can you see me up here? I can't believe you're going down there. I can't this get is any worse of my kids than to murder. go down there. You did that all by... Oh my also, the same kid that like broke a door. How do you let this happen? First of all, the boat. Can I have that? What it happened? I broke that. The, the shark coming. What happened? Evie, no, 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 no! Don't stand on that. Don't stand on this. The shark. The shark. Sharks. You're pretending you're in the ocean and so you broke my door? Yeah. Just think, if this is the type of thing unfolding on camera, it almost makes me wonder what all is happening off camera. Worry if dad and I are gonna get divorced? You do? I did not know you worried about that. How often do you worry about that? Um, probably <laughs> when I go to sleep when you're mo the, at the most oh, tired you, and then your mind starts going to extreme cases. Oh. Well, do you hear dad and I yell and fight a lot? <laughs> you're supposed to say no. <laughs> you're not supposed to say yes. And there was a time, I'll find, the, I'll find the photo. I had just had Russell and Julie was just crying a lot and whining. And, and one day I looked at her and I'm like, you just, Dink. She had like peed her pants or something and she it was just because she was being neglected because I was totally paying attention to the new baby and I thought you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna get somebody to help me with the little ones I'm gonna pay attention to you and so I bought her a new little dress at Walmart it was like one of those dresses you see for like 489 or whatever a really cheap dress it was just darling cute as can be and I gave her a bath and I brushed her hair and fixed it cute, and she was good. She was better. Between policing her children's social media, suppressing their access to technology, and failing to provide food, it would seem Ruby's parenting methods are a bit unorthodox. You could say the ethical side of Ruby and Kevin were especially brought to the forefront when their eldest son, 14 at the time, had been shipped off to a wilderness camp in the middle of the desert, leaving many wondering what he could have done to warrant such a harsh and- Oh no! Trigger warning, child camps! And otherwise life-altering punishment. We decided it was best to clue you guys in on what's been going on uh, a little bit with Chad and why Ruby and I are in a hotel room right now. But first, we have a sponsor. Did you know that Jay and Jay on myself with Star Wars? Some Skipping. pretty unfortunate 
On August 9th of 2019, Wilderness Ruby and Therapy her boys. wonderful husband Kevin emotionally relayed some pretty unfortunate news to their audience. And the guy says, Oh, you don't need to bring anything except 36 pair of underwear. When Chad heard it, he was like, I really am going to go live in the desert in my underwear. Is the music necessary? Is it really necessary? I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary. Chad today has just entered the Anasazi Foundation Wilderness Therapy Program, mm -hmm. where he's going to spend the next eight to ten weeks living in the um, Anasazi Desert. Yeah, the desert mountains of Arizona. It became evident that some unspecified behavioral episodes had led the couple to their final decision of sending their 14 year old son to live in the desert to be fixed, I guess. Where he would be stripped of all his basic commodities and forced to adopt a new minimalist, rugged way of living. The mindset here, of course, being that this change of pace would give him a new appreciation for the luxuries he has at home, assisting him along his spiritual journey with God. So the idea is with wilderness therapy is if you can survive with these peers in the wilderness with nothing more than the clothes on your back and a couple of field supplies, then there's nothing in this world that you can't tackle. And they said like, it's like the real wilderness out there. There's snakes, there's bears, there's coyotes, cougars. cougars. Like it's the real deal. We want Chad to have some of those experiences. I think close encounters would be good for him. Yeah, because those types of experiences can teach you what's really important. And he'll come home and he'll be like, dude, I survived and there were bears. I can do anything. I'm not scared at all about that kind of stuff. What I lose sleep over is when kids start self-sabotaging their own efforts. Yeah. That That's the kind of stuff that really concerns me. Just to stick it to their teachers or to stick it to their parents or family. That And the only person they're really hurting is themselves. Shut the f*** up. The Anasazi Foundation describes itself as a troubled teens wilderness organization specializing in restoring and strengthening parent-child relationships. Oh, and they're nonprofit, so they don't pay taxes either. Although they claim to be against behavioral modification on their website, I did find a glass door review from a former staff member who insisted Anasazi was more geared towards troubled teens by Mormon standards. The anonymous trail worker went on to describe the heavily dense Mormon staff as having minimal prior experience with kids, let alone troubled ones, vaguely alluding to the way certain campers were treated compared to others. I understand it's hard to gauge the legitimacy of an anonymous review, but the so-called therapeutic tab on their website hardly provides any insight to the specifics of their approach. It seems to throw out a bunch of vague and definite terminology that applies to a generally holistic set of principles. And although I don't know the specific issues their son is seemingly dealing with, it just feels counterproductive to ship any child away to a camp so loose in its approach to treatment. Like what even are the essentials of a healthy lifestyle? And how does teaching these basic things help somebody struggling with substance abuse? It's like putting a okay. band- I love that like they basically admit the reason why they're sending their child there. I know that it's like also Mormon, but so that, you know, add insult to injury. But the reason why they're That's fucking the sending their kids there six months. is so that the, the camp tortures them. And then that way the kid will know better about how great things were back home. Like, they admit it as much. They admit it. They literally fucking admitted it, dude. That's crazy to me on a bullet wound. It's not exactly the type of information to give me peace of mind. Reset, like a start over, like a do over, like a fresh beginning. Yeah. So, look, I can't really tell any parent how to raise their kids. I don't have the expertise, so I'm not exactly in the know when it comes to the way their children behave. Or at least I don't pretend to know as much as they do. But there is nothing, and I mean nothing, my kid could ever do that would make me think, huh, 
You know what would really help? Forcing them to sleep on the ground in the middle of the desert. Call me crazy, but that very concept sounds like it could worsen whatever it is they're already going through. Like, I'm sorry, Ruby, but in what universe would it be beneficial to pluck a troubled individual out of their element, in this case, seemingly against their own will, and throw them into an entirely new environment where they're forced to hold their own against new circumstances they've never been exposed to? I wouldn't know how to react. I'd feel betrayed. Aid. To me, it sends a message of, we don't want you here, which can only work to damage the trust necessary between a child and their parent. I'm not saying every experience with these camps has to be negative, but the dangerous potential of these decisions should not be overlooked either. And if you're from a family, and I know you are, you know that there are things that happen in your family that other people don't know about. And it's the same with our family. There are things that happen in our family you don't yeah, know about. Yeah, we don't film, we don't share, so. So just trust us that we're doing what's best. I'm really excited for Chad. Again, I don't know what's best for their family. I don't claim to know everything that goes down behind closed doors. In fact, according to her son, he had a great time. Granted, he said this in front of his mother on camera along with this. So me deciding that my stomach ache was Chad's fault was not seeing things in truth. Right. But I really, really want to blame him. <laughs> because I just want to be able to eat my dessert and Oreo cookies without stomach aches. And so... Then send me off to another wilderness camp again. So, <laughs> take that as you will. Chad, come do a Q&A. Where Radicalization did you go? Pogo. And I saw you. And where is that? Arizona, Tonto National Forest. Okay, why did you go there? Because I was a bad boy. <laughs> I heard this huge buzz behind me, and I looked up and it was a tarantula hawk, which is like in the top five most painful insect stings scale. It's on that scale. Aren't they poisonous too? Yeah, like that's why they're so painful. Cause they... Oh. And that landed on my forearm, and I, I started crying. <laughs> and I was in the alone in the woods. Although it was never really specified why he was sent to Anasazi in the first place, we know of some other behavioral complications that led to further punishment upon returning home. According to a deleted video on the Eight Passengers channel, the now 15 year old got into some pretty hot water after a series of pranks on his younger brother. Yeah, we never told our viewers that I woke Russell up at two in the morning and told him that we're going to Disneyland and he has to pack. <laughs> <laughs> got up and made his bed all neatly and then packed all his clothes in a suitcase and then he walked out the door and I'm like Russell and he's like what and he's all happy has his sunglasses on and I was like we're not going to Disneyland and he started crying and hitting me and then he went back to bed in tears and then so that that was that was not the reason you lost your room but that was all the other reasons because I pointed a BB gun at his face I need a BB gun at his face and hung him on the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Typical if you ask me. I think all siblings are going to pick on each other at one point or another That's just how siblings are the pranks me and my sister used to play on each other growing up make some of these look pretty tame by comparison And in my opinion, uh oh someone's going to fucking corrective behavior camp that's right, Jay Aubrey. That's where you're going. Time to... Time to get a fucking, yeah, tarantula attack of, of your own, okay? Lying to your brother about a Disneyland trip and letting him hang from a basketball hoop is entirely less cruel than what Ruby saw fit for punishment. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. What? I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave my room back like two weeks ago. Chad cool. showed that he was not able to manage himself sharing a bedroom with Russell. So when we moved, um, the bigger room in the basement was automatically his and I didn't have a room. It was only revealed in this video from 2020 that the L- Bro, okay. Remember how we were talking about like helicopter parents and yada yada and how this child abuse, like this is child abuse, okay? People were wondering. This is it. 
eldest son had been sleeping without a bed since October. For over half a year of his life, this child was forced to sleep on a beanbag chair because he pulled a few distasteful pranks on a sibling. He's 15. I understand. The irony is the parents are also pulling a prank. A prank called child abuse for YouTube content when harsher forms of punishment are sometimes justified, but I don't know when it would ever be appropriate to take away your child's own bedroom. So a lot of you are like, hey, that's not fair because Chad got the bigger, the lesser bedroom and Russell got the, the bigger bedroom. bedroom. <laughs> Russell got the big bedroom and Chad got the, the smaller bedroom smaller. and Russell's bigger bedroom. I feel like white American parents have two speeds, like whatever the fuck this Nazi shit is. Or just like letting your kid call you by your first name and like calling you a cunt and stuff and nothing in between. Both of those speeds involve leashes for some weird reason. Why are they doing this? I do not know. Also had a bathroom, but what you guys didn't know was <laughs> Chad didn't get any room. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he didn't get anything. He was sleeping on the floor in the family room. Not only is there an ethical issue with this, but think about all the physical side effects that could come from sleeping in a beanbag chair for that long. You're just asking for back pain, spinal issues. And this was right after he got home from that stupid wilderness camp too. So not only- I'm kidding white people. Don't get upset at me. It was a joke. Okay. I'm sure some of you have incredible parents. Did the camp evidently not work, but I guess they figured he didn't need a comfortable place to sleep anymore. Just look at the way Ruby's face changes as soon as he brings it up. It feels like we're not even supposed to know about this. Can't imagine why, of course. She only kept it under wraps for about seven months. Maybe I'm a little too soft though, right? Maybe I'm insane, I don't know. But to me, you shouldn't be punishing your child so ruthlessly after their trip to a correctional camp. You should probably be rewarded rewarding them after such a daunting and distressing experience, but yeah, that, that's just me. Maybe I really want my kids to turn out as snowflakes, I don't know. We need to face challenges, we need to face hardships. They're kind of hot though. Like, this dude is a BYU professor, like you know he was, he was piping up students, you know, every TA. Brilliant. And pain to develop resilience and grit, and that's what leads to success in life. If we make things easy on our kids all the time, they're going to grow up to be snowflakes. Yeah. And the thing is, bro, he was probably he's just sister wife shit. Chill. Some of you have never been to college and it shows, okay? We show and share, and the things that many of you are criticizing and calling abusive are actually things that mental health professionals have uh, counseled us to do. The most worrisome characteristic I find with parents in these situations is that they don't seem to have insight. They don't seem to be aware of how they could be causing harm. We see a lot of defensiveness. For example, in a video that Ruby put on Instagram, she said if people were looking Five at her parenting citizen, and being critical, those people might be projecting. Ruby and Kevin have a unique way of deflecting any criticism back onto their critics, becoming overly defensive anytime their own parenting skills are brought into question. And although I can kind of understand their frustration, I think it's completely within reason to examine whatever people decide to publicize online. In the case of these channels, they're explicitly picking and choosing what parts of their life to showcase. And assuming these clips reflect reality, it's only natural for up roar to ensue. Um, I want to go to the grocery store and I want to make dinner tonight. I could go into denigration and say I'm not a good mom or I'm not as good as other moms because other moms don't make their kids spend for themselves three nights in a row which would be comparison and I don't know that maybe other moms do like I don't know what they do in their homes um, but what I do know is that I am unchanging and I can choose any day now to go buy more groceries and make a more decent meal. Um, and I can feel centered instead of feeling shameful. But their parenting is just one piece of the pie. You also have to consider the pros and cons of recording certain events to begin with. For example, it's one thing to discipline your kid in private, but it's another to do it with a camera shoved in their face only to be monetized. What? Why did you? Eva! She finds everything! Go put this in my room. Where is she? Evie! You are not supposed to! 
supposed to open your packages. Is that mine? You know the rule. We're not supposed to open packages that are on the porch. Only mommy does that. You have a birthday coming up and now you saw your present. Sorry, mom. Kids can't exactly con Just get a new fucking gift, you psycho. You bought it with the content that you made <clears throat> and the money that you generated by exploit exploiting them anyway. Sent to this kind of coverage, and if it doesn't have enough of an effect on their lives now, think about how all of these clips could potentially be used against them in the future. There's no privacy. Some have likened it to living in a transparent house, but I think it's actually worse than that. If their house was actually transparent, then people would have to drive by to see in. That would essentially be a passive loss of privacy. But by recording everything and putting it on YouTube, they're engaging in an active destruction of privacy. But like I said, I'm hardly the first person to take issue with any of this. In fact, one of my friends, Ready to Glare, actually made her own video on this incredible family, along with another creator by the name of Sloan. I'd love to provide- Okay, that's literally just like hot mischief, dude. That's so weird. This guy is, is actually mischief. This is Miskiff before he became a fucking degenerate on Twitch. And when he used to make like, who are they videos, you know what I mean? Like, actually made good content, actually hot, old Miskiff. It's not just the fucking eyebrows, dude. Are you kidding me? Other creator by the name of Sloan. I'd love to provide clips of their videos in this one, but I'm afraid I can't do that. I'm just as kidding. both I think of Mr. their videos have been taken down at the will of, you guessed it, Ruby Frank herself. It would seem that despite the cruel and unusual punishment so frequently enacted upon her own kids, Ruby remains physically unable to take criticism herself. You'd think that a mother who has written an entire book on parenting would be more secure in her methods than to silence those for speaking out against her actions, but Ruby likes to keep you guessing. You never know what her next move is gonna be. In the case of these channels, that move was to issue a cease and desist. But when you have clips like these circulating around, I can't exactly say I blame her for wanting them gone. What I did was I went around the house and I have- one more way? Yes. That's my homework! Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Oh, well, homework. I need that to turn that in tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's like half my grade right now. If you have something in the bag that you would like out, you can pay cash for it. So you learn the value of your items. Family vlog. Dude. <laughs> I have yet to see a single thing libertarians would criticize in this entire video. Not a single one. Top to bottom, everything in this video, including that last moment, is literally a certified libertarian moment. Monetizing your children as slaves. Putting a fucking dollar value into like every minuscule commodity. This is what happens when you're just, this is your brain on libertarian Mormonism. Vlogging is still new, so we don't know the full impact such a lifestyle could have on a developing mind, making it one of the more shameless and potentially- <laughs> Just the baby technique, yep, the baby. ...actually risky genres on all of YouTube. If a parent wanted to make their own channel documenting their personal journey of raising a child, sharing advice without said child being involved in the making of those videos, I don't see a problem at all. But when you begin to incorporate children as young as five and six into your content, they become directly associated with your brand. The kids are literally the selling points of these vlogs. And filming every minuscule moment of your child's life since the day they burst out of the womb not only puts their own privacy at risk, but could potentially harm their perception of the world as they get older. We've already seen the catastrophic effects fame can have on child stars in Hollywood, so just imagine what that kind of attention could do when you don't even get a break from it in your own home. I imagine having a camera shoved in your face must stifle certain experiences. Like, what the fuck is gonna happen to Ryan's toy reviews, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wanna know.
No shot he's normal. ...instances in your life, and for some of these kids, it's literally all they've come to know. And to add insult to injury, child endangerment laws used to protect those in Hollywood from being exploited are not applied to social media on a wider scale, inviting any given parent to just flaunt their child with little to no regulation, begging the question of how far is too far. To me, Ruby Frank is just one of the many parents on YouTube who freely exploit the lives of their loved ones without even a second thought. Her husband directly enabling this vicious cycle by refusing to step in and do anything. Certain channels will happily jeopardize the privacy of their children if it means they can turn a profit and make themselves superstars in the meantime. To me, the blatant stripping of privacy against their child's own will greatly outweighs whatever entertainment value the 8 Passengers channel may carry, underlining the inhumane conditions that come along with exploiting an entire family. Bro, these are the same people that say racist ass like, shit like, oh, they're just having a lot of children for welfare. Meanwhile, she just literally popped them out for fucking content, dude. Little baby slaves, content slaves.